Dear Professor Barkley, uh, members of the Birgit and Stena Olsson Foundation, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jenny Nyström, and as the head of institute, I wish to welcome you to the University of Gothenburg, to the Sahlgrenska Academy, where the Institute of Neuroscience and Physiology and the Gilberg Neuropsychiatry Center is located. I am deeply honored to be here today uh, to introduce the eighth Birgit Olsson lecture, and I think we're all very much looking forward to this inspiring afternoon listening to Professor Barkley. Um, as a part of her last will and testament, uh, Birgit Olsson, who was married to Sten A. Olsson, the founder of the Stena Sphere, made a significant and uh, highly appreciated uh, donation to create the Birgit and Sten A. Olsson Foundation. The foundation contributes to the financing of the Gilberg Neuropsychiatry Center at our institute, led by Professor Christoffer Gilberg. The Gilberg Neuropsychiatry Center, the GNC, was founded in 2010 and features a highly successful group of approximately 75 researchers active in research on autism, ADHD, anorexia nervosa, and other essence disorders. Since 2011, the GNC has been organizing the Birgit Olsson Lectures. The lecture is given by an international authority in the field of one of the center's preferred research areas, anorexia nervosa, ADHD, or autism. And today, I'm deeply honored to introduce Professor Russell Barkley, who will give the eighth Birgit Olsson lecture entitled The Second Attention Disorder, Sluggish Cognitive Tempo versus ADHD. Professor Russell Barkley is a clinical professor uh, of psychiatry at the Virginia Treatment Center for Children and Virginia Commonwealth University Medical Center in Richmond, USA. He's a world-leading expert in ADHD and related disorders. Professor Barkley is a clinical scientist, educator and practitioner who has authored, co-authored and co-edited 20 books and clinical manuals. He's also one of the most cited researchers in the field of ADHD and has published more than 200 scientific papers and book chapters on the fields of ADHD and related. Uh, related. Um, um, his uh, research has been uh, both due to the nature and the assessment and treatment of ADHD and he has appeared on many US nationally televised programs to discuss topics pertaining to ADHD. He has also received numerous prestigious awards over his career for his work in ADHD and related disorders. Please join me uh, in warmly welcoming Professor Russell Barkley. We are deeply honored to have you here today. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. What a pleasure. Thank you. Good afternoon. Wonderful. Thank you. I wish my mother was alive to hear this. <laughs> And we're starting on time, which means this isn't Italy or Spain, is it? Always a pleasure to come here. So uh, I first want to begin by thanking uh, Dr. Gilberg and uh, Eva, Dr. Bilstedt, for the invitation to come and speak to you. It's quite an honor to be invited to give this uh, memorial lecture, and uh, I take it very seriously. So it's, it's truly a privilege. And to be back in Sweden, probably my fifth or sixth trip here, which is uh, wonderful. Uh, today I want to speak with you about a uh, condition that has only recently begun to receive re the research attention that it deserves, even though it was first identified at least in 1984, and some would say even as early as 1798. But serious attention was given to it only uh, within the past decade. Uh, now before I do, uh, at least in the United States, as Chris knows, it's commonplace for us to share our sources of financial support for the previous year so that the audience can evaluate whether there's any potential financial conflicts of interest with uh, this particular topic. Uh, so although I am semi-retired and spending more time with my grandchildren, obviously I continue to work and teach and write uh, as well. So let me begin with uh, the topic of interest today, and that is, uh, have we discovered another attention disorder that has gone unrecognized or, more commonly, misdiagnosed as a type of ADHD? 
Uh, and that is the question we're going to try to answer today from the standpoint of evidence of, of science. And so my objective is to, of course, educate you briefly about the history of sluggish cognitive tempo. I will use the term SCT frequently to refer to this condition. Uh, and uh, the emergence of research in that history. Uh, and then I'd like to go over the available evidence within the various fields that have accumulated so far. Uh, just in contrast, there's less than 100 research papers on SCT. There's more than 50,000 on ADHD. So that just gives you some idea of the relatively uh, understudied nature of this condition. I, I hope this talk changes that and that more people decide to investigate this other attention disorder. I'm going to briefly talk about some of the theories with regard to the underlying nature of the condition, though that, as you will see, remains hypothetical. Uh, and then I'll talk briefly about what we know about management or can infer about management from, from what we know. So just a, a brief history. Uh, you may not realize it, but the, the first reference to ADHD goes back to 1775, uh, when in uh, one of the first textbooks in medicine was published in Germany by Melchior Adam Weikert. And there is a chapter in there called Disorders of Attention. And in it is a description of what today we would recognize as the combined presentation of ADHD. But Weikert was describing just one prominent disorder of attention. It was his colleague and student, Alexander Crichton, who followed up, wrote a much expanded version of a medical textbook, a much longer chapter on dis disorders of attention, and now describes a second condition of low arousal, low power, withdrawal, and lethargy that characterized this second group of individuals. So th this might be the first historical reference to this other attention disorder. It is, of course, always speculative to try to know what he was trying to describe at that time and map it onto contemporary ideas of attention disorders. But we at least have to acknowledge that there's the possibility he was the first to recognize this. Uh, and then the beginning of true research is uh, mid-1980s, and it begins at the University of Georgia uh, with Benjamin Leahy, Karen Carlson, and one of their students, uh, Nieper. And at this time, we had in the dsm 3 attention deficit disorder, ADD, but broken into two types, with and without hyperactivity. The distinction at the time had very little research to support it. So a flurry of research studies was undertaken during that decade, attempting to identify just what separated these two conditions and was it justifiable to distinguish the two types. The end result of that decade or more of research was no. There were few, if any, differences between these groups. And by the time DSM-3R came around, it completely eliminated this possibility. Uh, and it relegated ADD without hyperactivity to the back of the manual, referred to it as undifferentiated attention disorder, and asked for more research. But it was no longer officially recognized. But at that time, Leahy and his students were looking to find new and better symptoms to include in the next edition of the DSM to identify ADHD. And so they generated a list of items, symptoms to use in interviews and rating scales and to investigate for how well they discriminated or identified that condition. It was during that research that Nieper found that a set of the symptoms that they were playing with at the time did not correlate well with ADHD, uh, did not seem to be useful uh, in discriminating it, recommended that they not be included in the DSM, uh, but recognized that they form their own little dimension of problems, of psychopathology. And he is the one who invented the term SCT. I will tell you, uh, I don't like it. I think it's demeaning. Uh, 
uh, and I have written a number of editorials to my colleagues uh, asking them to change the name to something less offensive to patients. But in the meantime, SCT it is, and that is what I will call it in this presentation, though please understand that I am against this term being used further uh, for this condition. So Nieper was the first to say, I've got a set of items. They're distinct from ADHD. They're not highly correlated with it. They form their own factor in a statistical procedure called factor analysis. Um, and here it is, and just gave it up to the field to do with it whatever they wanted, but certainly recommended to the DSM committee that they not use these items. Research continued on this ADD with and without hyperactivity, even though the DSM eliminated it. Uh, and we kept coming back, I was doing research at the time, and those of us who continued to study the differences kept finding that while there weren't many useful distinctions between those two types of ADHD, we kept coming back to this subgroup of people who were quite different qualitatively from the rest of the people we were studying, who had a lot of the symptoms that Nieper had identified in his research, uh, and who seemed to have uh, unique comorbidities, correlates, and in the case of our research, we were the first to show that they did not respond well to the stimulant medications that we were testing for people with ADHD. Research continued on this despite the DSM abandoning ADD with and without hyperactivity, uh, and then it sort of died off for a while after about the year 1990 to 1995. Wasn't much research going on then. And then DSM-4 brought the distinction back again with its types of ADHD. There was an inattentive type, a hyperactive type, and the most common is the combined type. So the inattentive type is really the old ADD without hyperactivity brought back again. Uh, this is very disconcerting because we had research that showed that this wasn't very useful, but it was done anyway. It was primarily done to satisfy clinicians who were complaining that they had no place to put people who had troubles with attention but did not have the other symptoms that were characteristic of classic ADHD. They weren't impulsive, they weren't hyperactive, and so what to do with them? So they were given another type of ADHD to use. And once again, researchers go back out and start looking at, are there differences among these types of ADHD? And so we have probably hundreds of papers comparing the types. And the end result of that is that it's not useful. And so they were eliminated in the DSM-5 and demoted to the term presentation. Uh, and that is simply meant to say that on any given day, someone with ADHD may have more symptoms of one dimension than the other. But it was not intended to convey a concrete category of a qualitatively different group of people. Uh, people could change presentations. Uh, you could have preschool children who were very hyperactive but not yet inattentive, being called hyperactive presentation. Within four years, they would likely become the combined presentation as they became inattentive. Uh, and then by adolescence, because the hyperactivity declines very quickly in ADHD, would then move into the inattentive presentation. So if you were growing up with ADHD, classic ADHD, you could go through all three presentations. And nothing's changed about you, other than on any given day, some symptoms are more prominent than others. So we were told to abandon all hope. There are no other subtypes. But a subset of those of us who were studying these groups kept coming back to the idea of let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. There is a subset of people who are inattentive, who we know because of our experiences with them are different. Let's study them outright. And that is when SCT began to get its own body of research uh, rather than uh, studying just ADHD individuals. So here is where we now stand. We have an inattentive presentation. 
we can subdivide it very nicely into children and adults who used to be in the combined presentation, but have lost their hyperactivity and now are being called inattentive. We should not change their name. They're always going to be combined types and we should treat them accordingly. There is a second group of people who are very annoying to clinicians because they are one symptom short of being in the combined type. They have six inattentive, five hyperactive. According to the DSM decision rules, they are inattentive and that's how they should be called. But they're just mild versions of the combined presentation and that's how they should be treated. After all, it is a dimensional disorder as Dr. Gilberg has been saying for many decades. We are dealing with a continuum in the population, not a category, and it's no surprise that some people are just one or two symptoms less than the combined presentation. So let's keep them with the combined type. Then there is the group that has high levels of inattention, very, very low levels of hyperactivity, almost no impulsivity. And what do we do with them? And this is the group that we were always singling out as showing elevations in the SCT symptom dimension that Nieper identified. How many people is this? Well, according to studies such as Keith McBurnett at San Francisco, at least a third of people being called inattentive presentation probably have this other disorder, maybe as many as 50% or more. Uh, by the way, just as an aside, I see some of you taking pictures with your cell phones. Uh, I do make my slides available. You simply have to ask me. I'll leave them with the uh, Gilberg Center, uh, and you can get them from them uh, as well. So you don't have to take notes or pictures uh, if you don't want to. So it's this group that now commands our attention. And previously, we would find them by going to an ADHD clinic, looking for people with high inattention, low hyperactivity, screening them for SCT symptoms, and studying them accordingly. The problem with that is that it immediately confounds the two disorders. If you're starting with a pipeline full of ADHD, you're gonna get a lot of overlap with ADHD in your SCT population. So more recently, within the past 10 years, we've been identifying people with SCT outright. They don't have to be referred to an ADHD center. We find them in schools, we find them in pediatricians' offices. I did a national survey of the United States and we found them that way. Uh, and that's a better way to identify them, to avoid the contamination or confounding that you get if you only look for ADHD centers to find these children. More often than not, by the way, they're being referred through learning disability, pediatric, uh, early behavior problem clinics, uh, rather than through psychiatry. And you'll see why that is in just a moment. So what is this research, these 90 or so papers, beginning to tell us about this group of individuals in comparison to ADHD? Have we found a new disorder? Uh, this is something that I am championing. I do believe we have. I think we're seeing the emergence of one disorder from another, just as we saw autism spring from childhood schizophrenia and bipolar disorder also from schizophrenia and ADHD from MBD and LD. We are witnessing the divergence of one disorder from another to try to improve clinical care and identifying more homogeneous subgroups of, of our patients. But what do you have to do in psychiatry to prove that? Uh, Lee Robbins, among others, set forth the uh, Washington criteria, uh, Washington University in St. Louis, uh, as did Dennis Cantwell and others, that if you're going to declare a new disorder, you need to show that it differs from other disorders along as many of these categories dimensions, areas of research as, as possible. So this is our task today. Let's go through each of these, let's see what we know, let's compare it to ADHD as the closest comparison disorder, though I'll have some things to say about other disorders as well, and let's see what we come up with. So you're going to be the jury, I'm going to be the prosecutor, I'm going to present my evidence, and you'll decide whether we've crossed the threshold required for a new disorder
uh, or not. Uh, even if you disagree that it's not so impressive yet as a new disorder, many people are arguing that it is a transdiagnostic condition, which means it's something we need to study as a deficiency, uh, that it cuts across traditional psychiatric disorders, uh, and that might be a better way to think of it for the moment until we get more research, because after all, the term disorder implies some official recognition by the powers that be, the American Psychiatric Association, the ICD committees, that we have met the criteria of evidence. Uh, I happen to think we have, but that's just my bias, and as Chris knows, I'm a bit of an impulsive individual anyway. I like to think of it as being decisive, but my relatives would say otherwise. And uh, certainly my family is part of the ADHD uh, phenotype, uh, and sadly, most recently, also the autism phenotype now. The symptoms that best identify SCT uh, are seen here. This is based upon a complete meta-analysis of all of the research that we have looking to find symptoms for this disorder. So my thanks to Steve Becker and his colleagues for this meta-analysis. These are the 16 best symptoms. So we have, obviously, behavioral symptoms of sluggish movement, slow movement. Uh, we have cognitive symptoms of daydreaming, staring, spacey, confused, mental fogginess, proneness to error in perceiving uh, things. Uh, so like ADHD, we're sort of seeing a two-dimensional disorder here, one of motor symptoms, and one of cognitive or uh, attentional symptoms. The problem with this list, as uh, Steve and I communicate regularly, as, and as he well knows, uh, is that four of these symptoms don't work very well and should be eliminated, and those are the ones in yellow. And, and the reason for that is as follows. Uh, first of all, uh, symptom 12 lacks motivation, uh, and uh, especially that one, is as common in ADHD as it is in SCT. So it's not discerning, it's not discriminating. It's a good symptom, people with SCT show that a lot, but it won't help you in differentiating a disorder, so we don't need it here. The other three symptoms are, or four symptoms, are symptoms of working memory and executive functioning more generally. And if you were to put them into a rating scale of executive functioning and then do the appropriate factor analysis, they would migrate over to a dimension known as self-organization, planning and problem solving. How well can you organize your mind, your thoughts, your behavior, and your goals to accomplish what you hope to do? Uh, and they no longer will load on an SCT dimension. So we need to get rid of them. Uh, and I did. So this is my rating scale of SCT. Uh, we reduced it to 14. We got rid of the overlap with executive functioning. Uh, the problem is, is that we also found the same thing. Items 13 and 14 are very common in ADHD children, as common as they are in SCT, so they're not helpful, and we need to get rid of them. So what we wind up with are 12 symptoms that work very well at identifying these people. Now, let's not forget that the word often has to appear in front of these symptoms, just as it does in ADHD. Uh, and that's not arbitrary, by the way. I, I, when I talk to people, it's like, well, where did you guys come up with that? Uh, the, the fact is that statistically, when you ask a population about a symptom, the word often is endorsed only about 2 to 10% of the time. So it begins to discriminate a developmentally inappropriate behavior. If you said sometimes or rarely, eh, those are very common symptoms. But the minute you get to often or very often, you begin to separate out what is abnormal, what is a symptom, what is statistically unusual in the population. And we've proven that many times. So don't discard the word often as just something capricious or arbitrary. It actually denotes a level of inappropriateness of a behavior that we can prove in the population identifies a very small set of people. 
And then if you require that they have multiple symptoms that occur often, now you're really getting to a developmentally inappropriate condition. Uh, and I emphasize this because sometimes people fall prey to the logic of the Church of Scientology in arguing that we're simply trying to diagnose normal children with psychiatric disorders because after all, don't typical children show these behaviors from time to time? So Barclay and Gilberg and others and Biederman are simply trying to create a disorder on behalf of the psychiatric drug community and uh, help them to make their profits. Uh, and so basically you're conflicted and you shouldn't be doing this. Uh, and I've been accused of that uh, many times, most recently about a year and a half ago in the New York Times, where it was declared that Barclay is trying to turn childhood daydreaming into a psychiatric disorder, which of course is nothing f close to the truth. But then journalism isn't about the truth anymore, is it? So. So, um, let's begin then. Number one, have we found a set of symptoms that is distinct from other types of psychopathology? The answer is yes. Those are the 12. And if you analyze them in the midst of symptoms of executive functioning, uh, IQ tests, ADHD dimensions, anxiety, depression, psychosis, uh, they form their own independent set of symptoms. They correlate more highly with each other than they do with any other type of psychopathology. Check. We have met the first criteria. We found a unique set of symptoms. Number two, are they dimensional or categorical? And how many dimensions are there? Looks to be one large dimension that can be usefully separated into two smaller ones. But with the understanding that the two dimensions we're talking about are very highly correlated with each other. And that's what we see in ADHD as well. It's what we see in autism. It's useful to create these dimensions, but don't ever think that they're independent or uncorrelated. They're highly correlated. Indeed, some studies find only one dimension. But we have two. And what's interesting is one is cognitive, Attentional, that's the daydreamy dimension, the spacey dimension, the other is the sluggish, slow-moving, hypoactive dimension. Okay, so we have some dimensions, not categories. They're distinct from other disorders. What else can we say about them? Well, we need to show that these dimensions correlate more highly with each other than they do with ADHD symptom dimensions. Uh, because some people have said, you've just discovered a type of ADHD, not something different. And so we've done that already. You can see in the correlations here that the two dimensions of uh, SCT correlate with each other about 0.75 to 0.8, which is the same thing we see in ADHD, by the way, and correlate much less with ADHD symptoms, though there is a moderate correlation within attention in ADHD. And you can see that here, about 0.4, maybe 0.5. Don't be so impressed. If you square the correlation, it tells you how much variance they share with each other. And it's about 16 to 20%, maybe 25%. What does that mean? It means most of the information in one dimension is not contained in the other disorder. And that is very important in showing a new psychopathology, a new attention disorder. We have found these symptoms in these dimensions to exist in every form of measurement that we have studied. That's also an important distinction. If we only found it in teacher reports and it disappeared in parent reports, uh, we couldn't see it in classroom observations, but we could see it in clinic observations, this would not be reliable, it would not be impressive. The SCT dimension has been found in every single approach to measurement used. All of the ones I've already mentioned, parent reports, teacher reports, self-reports, adult reports, clinic observations, classroom observations, same dimension shows up everywhere, and it doesn't matter how you assess it. Uh, in other words, this is a very robust dimension of human behavior. And it's not frivolous or specific to some issue of methodology or measurement. The next thing we, we want to see is, do these factors, these dimensions, uh, link up with depression, anxiety, other kinds of conditions. 
because if they do, then maybe this is just depression under another name. Or as my chairman, who's an expert in hypersomnia in psychiatry said, all you've done is to rename hypersomnia, daytime sleepiness. Uh, good point. So we need to go about our business and see whether or not you can distinguish these things. And here's a beautiful study done by my colleague just down the street, Joshua Langberg, also one of the emerging experts in this, along with his colleague Steve Becker and others. And what you're seeing here are SCT symptoms relative to depression. And what this shows you is that these are distinct. You see the depression symptoms up at the top, uh, and they form their own cluster versus the symptoms of SCT. Uh, there's a little bit of overlap with the drowsy, sluggish movement dimension that you might expect to overlap with depression, but much, much less with the cognitive attentional symptoms that you see down below. So the distance between the different symptoms and clusters is a measure of how distinct they are from each other. But the most important thing is that the depression symptoms form their own cluster. Uh, and SCT is not a form of depression. Uh, this has now been demonstrated also with daytime sleepiness and with anxiety. So we can safely address our critics. No, we're not just renaming another disorder as SCT. We can show how distinct they are. Well, now we come to the issue of are there demographic differences between these people, and particularly people with ADHD. That's the closest disorder we have to distinguish it from. That's the hardest disorder to distinguish it from. So what do we find? Well, we've done national surveys of children and adults, uh, as you see here in the United States, and we have a prevalence of SCT if we want to create a category or a disorder like we do in DSM. We have a prevalence of 4 to 5 percent depending upon uh, the age, but it's roughly in that area, about 5.4% of adults and about 4.7% of children have SCT. And how do we categorize them? They had to have symptoms that occurred often for at least six months that led to impairment and placed them above the 93rd percentile of people their age. How many symptoms does it take to do that? Three. Three out of the 12 symptoms will put you in the top 7% of the US population. So these are very rare symptoms in the population. And it doesn't take many to begin to distinguish you from typical people. So three or four, depending upon which study you look at. Uh, so how common is it in clinics? Uh, we've only begun to look. The first study done in Spain says one in five children coming to a psychiatric outpatient clinic has SCT. If they have autism or ADHD or LD, that rate is considerably higher. But just being referred to a clinic starts to pull out one in five children as meeting these criteria. To put it another way, SCT is as common as ADHD. And as we showed in our national survey, part of the rise in the diagnosis of ADHD in the United States is the result of creating an inattentiveness in ADHD and then putting these people in it, which inflated ADHD from a prevalence of 4 to 5% to a prevalence of 7 to 10%. If you take these people out of that prevalence survey, the prevalence of ADHD goes back to what it has always been over the last 30 to 40 years. There's been no rise in ADHD at all. What you did, as we did with autism spectrum, is you broadened the definition, you rolled in another disorder into it, or at least something related to it, and voila, prevalence explodes, the media gets upset, the public is outraged, psychiatry is criticized yet again for expanding disorders, and making money for the drug companies, uh, which is very difficult to say because there's no drug for SCT at the moment. But uh, that said, uh, that's sort of the criticism here. So what we see then is SCT is a very prevalent disorder. It's about 1 in 20 children and about the same in adults. The surprising thing is that there was no change with age. Unlike ADHD, which shows a 3 to 1 
male to female ratio in childhood, two to one adolescence, about one and a half to one by adulthood. Uh, SCT shows no such distinctions between age and sex. It is an equal opportunity disorder, and it does not decline with age. From ages five to 92 in our survey, no decline, no difference whatsoever. Whereas in ADHD, there is a remarkable decline from childhood to adolescence, particularly in the hyperactive dimension of the disorder, and we see none of that here. So we've now got several demographic differences that distinguish this condition from an ADHD-type disorder. In addition to that, we began to find something that was quite surprising. Uh, we know uh, from research done here in Sweden and elsewhere that ADHD is somewhat related to social disadvantage, uh, low education, uh, differences in uh, income uh, as well, uh, as well as greater disability within the family. More psychiatric disorders, more imprisonment, more criminality, more drug use. So we were quite surprised to see that uh, SCT was worse. We did find that in our results. ADHD is related to those things. SCT was even more likely to be associated with them. And that was a bit surprising, but I will have more to say about that when we get into what is the nature of SCT. So let's move on to the cognitive dimension of establishing a new disorder. Is there evidence of cognitive differences? Some, not a lot yet, but here's what we're finding. The most reliable difference from ADHD is there is no impulsivity in this disorder. No evidence on testing, on rating scales, and so on, of disinhibition. If anything, the last few studies that have been more rigorous have found that they're negatively correlated. If you have SCT, you will be less impulsive than a typical person. You're actually going the other way. So that is known as a double dissociation in psychology, and it's very important in proving a unique disorder. One disorder goes one way in its correlations, the other goes the opposite direction. You cannot argue that they are just proxies for each other. And so we have found that in terms of impulse control. So SCT is not an inhibitory disorder. ADHD is a massive disinhibitory disorder, a self-regulation disorder. ADHD correlates with IQ. Uh, correlations run usually between about 0.3, 0.4. Uh, they share about 10 to 16% of their variance, and they're negative. The higher your ADHD, the lower your IQ will be, on average, about 7 to 10 points lower in population studies. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, the genes for one are actually the genes for the other. And that was shown just yesterday in the largest study of DNA done in psychiatry. Uh, this is the uh, genome-wide uh, loci study in nature genetics that just appeared uh, within the past day. And what did they find in studies of 55,000 people? Uh, nearly half had ADHD. Uh, they looked at 300 other traits within this study, one of which was intelligence, uh, and they find that there is a striking negative significant correlation between the genetic loading of intelligence and the shared genetic loading with ADHD. So there's a reason that these two psychological traits are correlated negatively, and that is that they have an underlying genetic, uh, shared genetic basis to them. Uh, so with SCT, uh, the relationship to IQ is unreliable. A few studies find it. Studies such as my own do not. Uh, community studies don't find it. Uh, so if there's a link to IQ, it's very small. Whereas in ADHD, it's robust, it's reliable, it's repeatable, uh, and just about any study that looks for it finds it. And by the way, there's also a developmental linkage between them. Uh, people with ADHD will find their IQ continuing to decline the longer they have their disorder, and also starting out with low IQ increases the likelihood of developing ADHD over the next period of uh, follow-up. 
Uh, so there might even be an etiological relationship between them, not just a genetic relationship. Another finding that is emerging but not yet uh, definitive is slow responding to tasks, whether it is the perceptual motor speed task of the Wechsler scales, whether it's a reaction time test, very simple. People with SCT are just reliably slow in their motor responding. Uh, ADHD people can be, but as uh, Chris and many others know, uh, the finding in ADHD is not slowness, it's variability. Indeed, Marcel Kinsborn in the 1970s referred to ADHD as VD, variability disease. It was a semi-humorous reference, of course, to venereal disease, but uh, the, the point is that what, what distinguishes ADHD from others is not the mean score, it's the standard deviation. The variability of responding, even on a simple reaction time task, is three times greater in people with ADHD than in the typical population. It is such a hallmark of ADHD that it is the most reliable neuropsychological finding across the entire literature. If you want to pick a single laboratory measure that picks up ADHD relative to everything else, it's going to be a reaction time variability. Uh, so SCT doesn't show that. The variability of SCT is right in the typical narrow range. They're just slow. So to summarize, one has slow reaction time, one has highly variable reaction time due to their inattentive, distractible, impersistent behavior. When we give batteries of attention tests, these kids show up as having problems with focus of attention. That is, they can't quickly focus on to what is important from what is unimportant in the stimulus you're giving them. That is not a characteristic of ADHD. ADHD is a lack of persistence. People with ADHD don't have trouble picking up what's important. They just don't care. They don't respond. Uh, and if they do respond, they don't stay with the response. So what you're seeing is an impersistence, not a focusing problem. Uh, to put it very simply, there's nothing wrong on the perceptual side of the brain in ADHD specifically. There probably is something going on on the perceptual side in SCT. Uh, and it, it appears to be this dimension that Posner and Mirsky would refer to as the focus-orient aspect which we know is mediated by the posterior hemispheres, particularly the parietal lobes. So, there may be some interesting differences here, but we need a lot more research on that. What about executive functioning? Well, if you give a test battery of executive functioning to SCT, sometimes you get a little working memory deficits. Oftentimes you get nothing. They're not different from other children. Uh, so the Working memory deficit is not reliable. If you give a battery to ADHD children, you get a lot more deficits across measures, working memory, impulse control, and so on. Uh, but even there, only about a third of kids with ADHD are impaired on EF tests. However, if you give an executive function rating scale to people with ADHD, they are universally impaired above the 93rd percentile across all dimensions. So according to rating scales, ADHD is EFDD with the wrong name. And that, of course, is my opinion. Um, but if you give a test battery, uh, as many of my colleagues like to do, and you believe that testing is the face of God and the voice of God for sure, uh, which many of my colleagues also do, uh, then you're going to conclude that only a third or less of ADHD people have EF deficits. Therefore, ADHD cannot be an executive disorder. And that debate continues to this day in the published scientific literature. There's, there's one fatal flaw that my colleagues in neuropsychology overlook, if not outright ignore. Um, ratings and tests have no correlation with each other. The test batteries of executive functioning have absolutely no relationship to the rating scales. And you might say, well, so much the worse for the rating scales, because after all, the tests are the gold standard. But wait a second. The rating scales cover at least six months to a year of observations by people who know you well, teachers, parents, others. Uh, the tests capture none of that. The tests take about 15 minutes each. 
They're done in an artificial clinic setting by someone you don't know. Uh, they are largely cold, cognitive, informational in nature, which is why they correlate with IQ. Uh, and uh, they predict nothing. So if predicting impairment in life is why we assess people, which it is, then we have shown in a number of publications, not just my own research team, though we certainly started it, that the tests predict nothing, the rating scales predict everything. So if you want to know if someone is impaired in school, social relationships, managing money, raising their children, holding a job, driving a car, give a rating scale. That will predict all of those outcomes. Give a test battery, predicts nothing but your scores on an academic achievement test at school, and it won't even predict that if you covary IQ. So why are you giving the tests? It's a question I keep asking my colleagues. You're giving the worst measure possible of executive functioning. You're drawing conclusions about a variety of psychiatric disorders. You're making high stakes decisions about patients whose lives depend on the scores from these test batteries as to whether they get support, accommodations, disability determinations, and so on. And you're using a test battery that has no validity. Why are you doing this? This is tantamount to malpractice. And yet it's done every day with thousands of people in my country because of psychologists and their collaborators who think that the tests are the only objective way of dealing with this and that rating scales are somehow subjective and tainted. And all of the evidence points in the opposite direction. So I am on a campaign, as I have been for five years now or more, to convince my colleagues to stop it that if you want to assess executive functioning in order to say something about this person's life, how they're going to function, where they're going to be impaired, what they're going to be like in the future, the rating scale will beat the test four to five times more variance explained by the rating scale. So the cheap subjective rating scale will beat your test battery every time. That's probably why we're seeing what we see in ADHD, where only a third of our patients fail the test. You just assessed it wrong. Had you assessed it through a rating scale through parents and teachers, you would have seen massive executive impairment. And that's not just my opinion. If you take ADHD symptoms and you correlate them with executive functioning symptoms, they are, as we say in statistics, co-linear. They do not form separate dimensions from each other. That fact alone tells you that ADHD, at least as assessed by ratings, is EFDD under another name. Uh, SCT is not. And here's the evidence for that. This is my executive function rating scale. This is based on our national survey of 1,800 children from ages 5 to 18. And we can break our groups into four groups. We have the control group. We have those with ADHD only in the red, SCT in the yellow, and those who had both disorders. Isn't that interesting? If you forget DSM, which says you can't have both of these disorders because they're subtypes of each other, uh, and you treat this as comorbidity, well, guess what? You have people that have both disorders. So what's the message you should take home from this? The first message is, ADHD on every dimension is worse than SCT. When ADHD and SCT combine, the population is even worse than either disorder alone. This graph, however, would tell you that there's got to be some executive deficits in SCT. I mean, look at that yellow bar compared to that white bar. That's the control group. But you would be wrong, and here's why. Remember, SCT correlates to some extent with ADHD inattention, about 0.4. So that's a contamination. What do you get if you remove the overlap? You get that. That's the amount of variance explained on the rating scale by the different dimensions of these disorders. SCT explains nothing. SCT is not related to executive functioning at all. Any relationship that appears initially is due to comorbidity.
and overlap to some extent with inattention in ADHD. Inattention in ADHD accounts for nearly all of the variants in that rating scale, which is why many of us have come to view the inattention dimension as an executive dimension. They're one and the same. And by the way, there are no ADHD symptoms in that rating scale. So you can't say that we somehow artificially inflated the relationship. We made sure there were no ADHD symptoms in that rating scale. And yet, ADHD accounts for the vast majority of the evidence. This is the adult study. So this is ages 18 to 89. Now we're beginning to see something interesting. The longer you have SCT, particularly into adulthood, it begins to create problems in self-organization. It is also linked to some extent, but negatively, to impulse control. So just as we found in children, if you have SCT, you are likely to be very inhibited compared to even typical people. And it looks like there's something going on with emotion regulation, but I'll explain that shortly, because SCT has a strong relationship to depression. So this just summarizes the graph that I just showed you, so I'll skip over that. So what have we found? We have found that ADHD is a massive disorder of executive functioning. SCT has little, if any, association with executive functioning. And that's just more evidence that these are not proxies, not subtypes. Which means, can they overlap? If it's comorbidity, uh, what's the overlap? In the US population, this is the overlap. I'll just summarize it very quickly by saying half of people with one disorder have the other disorder, but half don't. So they're not proxies, they're not subtypes. They're separate disorders that can be comorbid. The relationship here, by the way, is identical to that between anxiety and depression. And we treat them as distinct, which they are, but we recognize that many people with one will get the other, and that the longer you have one, the greater the odds you will develop the other. And that, I think, is what we are seeing here as well. So I treat that as evidence of a comorbid relationship, not a subtyping relationship. What about in school? Interestingly, SCT is as bad in school as ADHD when it comes to achievement, performance, grades, and the quality of work that you're doing. They, of course, are quite different when it comes to behavior, decorum, disruptiveness. ADHD is a highly disruptive disorder. Uh, SCT uh, isn't. But when it comes to the performance of the academic work itself, this is a very bad disorder to have. We've also found that ADHD, if you study its mistakes, is a problem with production. People with ADHD just don't do a lot of work. But what work they do is usually correct. The difference, 85% correct in ADHD, 94% in typical children. That's a very minor difference. It's one reason why ADHD medications don't improve academic achievement. There's not much to improve when you only have a 9% difference. The problem with ADHD children is they don't do any work. In SCT children, it's not a production problem. When we study them in school, what we see is errors, lots of mistakes. And it doesn't matter if they finish their work, a lot of it's going to be wrong because they're not focusing on what's essential from what's non-essential in the work. At least that's our observation of how these children do work. We have four studies that show that SCT links up with disorders of arithmetic, a dyscalculia, much more than it does disorders of language, reading, and handwriting. Uh, ADHD shows the opposite, and there's one study that shows that that's possibly a genetic relationship. We need more research on this, but there's a tantalizing finding that the learning disabilities that link to SCT might be a little different than the learning disabilities we see in ADHD. Both disorders have learning disability as a comorbidity, but perhaps a different pattern to those learning disabilities. ADHD, of course, contributes to school disruption, 
school discipline, being expelled or suspended from school as a form of discipline, and SCT children show none of that. But that is because they're not aggressive, they're not impulsive, they're not hyperactive, they're not disruptive. They're just good little kids who stare in the back of the classroom and don't do anything. That is, what little they do is wrong. So uh, SCT is a very different picture in a school system than ADHD does. And for this reason, you'll see ADHD referred to psychiatrists because of its association with aggression and antisocial behavior, and SCT gets referred to learning disability, specialist, special education, and developmental and behavioral pediatrics. So if you're looking to find these children, you're going to find them getting referred through different channels within our community. Are there family differences? Yes. Uh, SCT children are pretty good kids to raise. If we look at general levels of parenting stress, they're very high in ADHD children, especially because parenting stress is related to oppositional disorder. And ADHD has 11 times more comorbidity with ODD than in the typical population. Uh, so it's really the defiance, the anger, the hostility, the aggression, the refusal that drives parenting stress, and ADHD is a very distressing disorder. And in fact, if you look across situations in the home, uh, you will find that there is almost no situation in which ADHD children are not very distressing to manage to their parents. When you look at SCT, you get isolated pockets of concern. Homework, schoolwork, and sometimes peer relationships. And I'll explain that in just a moment. But you don't get this massive, pervasive, distressing level of reports from parents as you get in parents who are trying to raise an ADHD child. Uh, by the way, in case you don't know it, research that Chris and I have done shows that ADHD is as or more difficult in parenting as autism. Uh, the levels of parenting stress are equivalent, if not worse, in ADHD. This is why the peer relationship problems exist. The most reliable finding in the literature to date is SCT is linked to social withdrawal, apprehension, perhaps anxiety, and basically just lack of interest, low initiative. Not like psychotic or autistic children are. They're just shy, withdrawn. They remind me of Jerome Kagan's overly inhibited children that he studied in his research at Harvard. So they're less impaired socially than ADHD children would be, but they're more impaired than typical children. They have fewer friends, but they have more friends than ADHD children are going to have. To put it in Ken Dodge's terminology, ADHD children are rejected, SCT children are neglected. They're overlooked as opposed to typical children who are accepted. So those are your sort of three taxonomies of social relationships, and they differ in those here as well. So both contribute to social impairment, but they're doing it through unique pathways. One through withdrawal, apprehension, and shyness, overly inhibited, and the other through aggression, disruption, impulsivity, intrusiveness, uh, and aggression. What about comorbidity with other disorders? Well, here the two disorders separate massively from each other. And again, the findings are highly robust. There is no relationship of SCT to oppositional disorder. And by inference, nor will there be to conduct disorder, antisocial personality, psychopathy, or drug use. Because it is that dimension of oppositional disorder that predicts those downstream problems in our longitudinal studies. And since SCT children not only have no risk of ODD, their risk is lower than the normal population. The relationship between SCT and ODD is negative, not neutral or positive. SCT protects you from oppositional disorder. And by consequence, it's also going to protect you from the downstream disorders that go with it. The bad news is you have a much higher likelihood of having depression than even ADHD children do. Uh, indeed, several studies show that any link between ADHD and depression is explained by this dimension. If you examine it and you pull it out, ADHD has no relationship to depression. 
If you don't examine it, you will misattribute a comorbidity that perhaps may not be there. So that is another reason why researchers need to assess for SCT in their results, because they will misattribute a finding to another disorder when in fact it's this silent, unrecognized disorder that we see. Both disorders have comorbidities, but with SCT it's going to be more internalizing disorders, depression, anxiety, withdrawal, and with ADHD it's going to be more externalizing disorders, ODD, conduct disorder, aggression, psychopathy, delinquency, and eventually antisocial personality by adulthood. Both disorders are linked to autistic spectrum disorders, though there's very little research at the moment. Uh, I don't want to say that it's definitive, but a study published just a few months ago out of Cincinnati shows that it's SCT that is much, much more common in autistic spectrum than ADHD. But because researchers only identify ADHD and its inattention, they attribute that to autism. Had they assessed SCT separately, they wouldn't have done so as often. So one of the problems with the comorbidity studies between ADHD and autism is a failure to look for another disorder that might be mediating that relationship or explaining that relationship, not, not mediating it. That's not the appropriate term here. ADHD children have higher rates of comorbidity with all other forms of psychopathology, as you see here whereas half of the children with SCT had no other disorder. Uh, in ADHD, that's very uncommon. ADHD almost always has comorbid disorders along with it. There are two studies of personality traits. Uh, they also show reliable differences. SCT is related to fear of punishment, uh, whereas ADHD is related to sensation and reward seeking. And that makes sense. If SCT tracks with internalizing disorders, internalizing disorders like anxiety and depression have very high levels of perceived threat from other people in social situations. Indeed, it's one of the hallmarks of anxiety disorders is an overinterpretation of threat, harm, uh, and other adverse consequences. Uh, ADHD doesn't show that. SCT does. So we need some more research on that, but we're working on it. Okay, this is our national survey. This is my impairment rating scale for children. I'll put in a plug for it. It's the only normed rating scale of impairment in existence, and we have one for adults as well. That shocked me. You would think that there would be norms for impairment in children and adults on rating scales, and there isn't, and the ones we have are trivial. There's four items on the CBCL. How many friends do you have? How are you doing in school? Uh, we assess 15 different domains of children's lives, and here's what you see. Now, it's a busy slide. It's very noisy. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on it. What I do want to point out are a couple of findings. First of all, with few exceptions, ADHD, the yellow bar, is more impairing than SCT, with few exceptions. Yeah. One of those is in sports. The other one is with your father, except that fell out when we controlled for the sports one. Why is that? Your father spends more time engaged in sports with you. So the sex difference between parents was being driven by the propensity to play sports with your child. Otherwise, the exclamation marks are where ADHD is a much, much worse disorder. But I want to point out something that most people don't look at unless I mention it. Look at the blue bar. The light blue bar I think it's blue anyway. So sometimes the projectors change colors. <clears throat> and I'm also colorblind. Uh, the blue bar shows what? It shows that if you have both disorders, you are markedly more impaired than either disorder by itself. Now, why is that important to a psychopathologist like me? It means that the disorders are additive. They're not duplications. They're not proxies. They're not representations of the other disorder. If they were, having both disorders wouldn't make you any worse off than having either disorder by itself. But repeatedly, we have seen additivity when both disorders link up with each other. That's just another sign that there's something unique about SCT that contributes additional explained variation in impairment. These are the adults, again, ages 18 to 89. 
in this particular study, now we saw something we didn't expect to see. SCT is worse than ADHD in the three areas with the asterisk. Worse. That is shocking. ADHD is a very impairing disorder in educational and occupational settings. By adulthood, SCT is worse than ADHD in those settings. Look at the third one, the third difference. I know it's rather humorous, but sexual relations with other people are much more adversely affected by SCT than ADHD. And I sort of struggled with that until I spoke to some of my female colleagues, as well as my wife, who said that if you space out and daydream when you're supposed to be making love to somebody, the relationship is over. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> if your partner has to say, Earth to Steve, I'm still here, remember me? You know, person you happen to be lying with, right? Um, that's a sign of disinterest. <laughs> so, so it's not good. Uh, but the real surprise was in the educational and occupational domains. And, and by the way, in case I didn't point it out, notice again, additivity, where you have both disorders, you are markedly worse than somebody with either disorder alone. So to summarize, I'll just do this very quickly because it's very boring. ADHD is a markedly more impairing disorder across the board than is SCT alone. When both disorders link up, you get additive impairment, but there are certain isolated domains of life activities in which SCT is actually worse than ADHD. And that's a double dissociation, and that's what we want to see if you want to prove that SCT is unique. This was done in answer to my chairman, is SCT daytime sleepiness? And Joshua Langberg did this study and showed that while there is some relationship between ratings of hypersomnia and ratings of SCT, they cluster differently, they factor analyze differently, they share only 25% of their variation, which means that the variation in one is unique to it and not shared most of the time with the other, and therefore it is not hypersomnia by another name. So we can throw that out uh, as well. So it's not depression, it's not anxiety, it's not hypersomnia, it's not ADHD, it's not autism. What the hell is it? I don't know, but it's not those other disorders, and that's important. So what causes it? We're not sure. How many studies of etiology are there? Less than 10. So we don't know. But let's look at some of the glimmering findings here. There are now three neuroimaging studies. The slide is wrong. They all indicate that SCT is correlated with posterior activity in the default mode network of the brain, which is largely in the parietal area and its overlap with the temporal lobes, and more on the left than the right, though it is obviously bilateral. Uh, and it is the network responsible for, ta-da, Daydreaming begins to suggest that maybe what we're seeing here is pathological daydreaming. We'll see. Now, ADHD is related to this network as well, but in a very circuitous way. What do I mean by that? ADHD shows a bit of a renegade default mode network because the frontal lobe executive system that is supposed to rein it in and control it when there's a goal to be done is very poor. So there's little executive management of the mind-wandering module in ADHD, right? but that's an executive failure, not a default mode network problem. In SCT, it's the other way around. There's no evidence of an executive network problem in SCT. So we may well have a problem with the DMN, the default mode network, that is independent of any executive problems in its management. There was one study that looked at EEG and evoked potentials, and it found that there was a striking difference between the two disorders. In SCT, the problem was very low evoked potentials when the stimulus first hits the brain. Less than 100 milliseconds. So literally, as soon as the brain is detecting a stimulus, the detection is smaller. There's something about the sensory cortex that is not doing well at sensory detection. 
In ADHD, the problem is in the frontal network that contributes at about 300 plus milliseconds out, and that is the persistence activation aspect of an evoked response. Uh, so there may be some differences here. Again, one or two studies doesn't make a conclusion, but some tantalizing suggestions, yet again, that there's something in the posterior aspects of the brain that are linked to this disorder, whereas it's primarily anterior aspects of brain functioning in ADHD. Most recently, there is a study that is in press in China. The study was reviewed just a couple of weeks ago, and it shows that there is a difference in heart rate variability and in responding to sudden changes in the environment. Uh, basically, the difference is this. ADHD children are, show under arousal, and if a stimulus occurs, if there's a sudden change in the task, they don't activate to the, uh, to the change as well as other people. And we've known that going back to Keith Connor's work in the 1970s. There is an under arousability in ADHD. In SCT, we show slightly lower resting heart rate, but when there is a change, there is an overactivation in variability, which is consistent with anxiety, fear, concern, and worry. So the heart rate data actually match the internalizing symptom relationship here. But again, one study, and China at that, so we have to replicate this with other labs, with other ethnic groups, and so on. Some additional findings, these are just like one or two studies each. Let's look at relationship of SCT to other disorders, and two of them have been looked at. The first is fetal alcohol syndrome. SCT is much more common in FAS and FAE exposed babies as they grow up than is ADHD. Indeed, this study suggests that as in autism, there is an over-attribution of comorbidity to ADHD because you didn't assess for SCT. Had you done so, you would have pulled those kids out and you wouldn't see a stronger relationship to ADHD. By the way, the same was found in studies of survivors of childhood leukemia. The treatments for leukemia produce an attention disorder in survivors. Uh, and uh, it looks like it's more SCT than even ADHD. And yet earlier studies only looked at ADHD and so reported that there was an increase in ADHD inattentive presentation in leukemia survivors. Um, and that may not be the case. So again, we need to explore this more fully. I don't want you to walk out of here assuming that this is all cast in stone and cut and dried and we know what we're talking about. These are just tantalizing findings to go further in looking at these populations. But it looks like you can acquire an SCT-like syndrome from certain injurious brain processes. Alcohol, the neurotoxicity of the ALL treatments, chemotherapy and radiation, uh, and others. So time will tell. We'll see. Now, look at the one study of twins, and it's just one, though someone has told me that they've replicated this, but they haven't published it yet. Uh, ADHD is a highly heritable disorder, among the most heritable disorders in psychiatry, rivaled only by autism and bipolar disorder in the degree to which human variation is explained by genetic variation. In case you're not familiar with it, the average heritability is 0.76 in ADHD, which means 76% of individual differences in this room in ADHD are due to genetic differences in your genome. Uh, and by the way, that figure climbs to 90% or higher if you use clinical levels of ADHD, diagnostic levels. Uh, but we'll, we'll stick with the 0.76 because it, it's still substantial. Uh, and just for comparison purposes, students out there, the heritability of IQ is 0.55, the heritability of personality is 0.4, the heritability of depression is 0.3 to 0.4, and the heritability of anxiety is about 0.3 to 0.4. So to summarize, ADHD is twice as heritable as personality traits, depression, and anxiety, and is close to the heritability of human height, which is 0.91. Uh, so, as we can say in psychology, we have discovered among the most heritable human psychological traits is the traits underlying ADHD. What did they find in this study with SCT? It was nearly as heritable, but not quite. 
0.6, roughly. 0.55 to 0.6, depending upon how they looked at it. So it's up there. It's a pretty substantial one, but not as heritable as ADHD, which means there's more room for environmental factors contributing to SCT than to ADHD. And now I will go back to the demographics. Remember the link to social disadvantage, parent disability, parent unemployment, low economic status. Maybe now we're seeing why SCT has an even stronger relationship to those. They may have a certain ideological role in an SCT presentation than they have an ADHD. And to support that, I just ask you to think about PTSD. Which of these two attention disorders do you think is most common in PTSD? It's SCT. It's the staring, the daydreaming, the preoccupation with your thoughts, the mind wandering, the hypervigilance, uh, then it would be an ADHD presentation. Indeed, if ADHD occurs with PTSD, it's usually a pre-existing condition, and it biases you to be more likely to develop PTSD in response, including in military veterans. Um, but ADHD does not arise from that. All right, so let's, let's cut to the chase here. Let's begin to look at uh, what have we seen now in the nature of SCT. Well, it could be a disorder of arousal. Maybe it's brainstem. I don't know. I don't think so. But uh, the relationship to sleepiness doesn't uh, seem to support that. Uh, it could just be another disorder of attention. It's a focus problem, not an attention problem. It could be related to OCD. You're a ruminator, and you're just repeatedly ruminating over your problems. But the one I love is this one. It's a form of pathological mind wandering. You have an out-of-control default mode network, and you can't regulate your daydreaming, your mind wandering. It's almost a Walter Mitty syndrome, if you want. We can't prove that, but the neuroimaging studies are supportive. Uh, this is just a slide on mind wandering. I'll skip it. This is a beautiful review of all neuroimaging evidence with regard to human mental states. It was published just a couple of years ago. Uh, and this is all human mental activity carved up into two dimensions. And you can see this is the executive dimension that you see here. And this is the one that ADHD destroys, is goal-directed attention. And mind wandering is here, a somewhat different mental state just above nighttime dreaming. Uh, but very different than the ruminating OCD type states more in the area of spontaneous thought, but unwanted spontaneous thought. If you're not familiar with it, there's your default mode network. It's primarily a posterior uh, uh, hemisphere impairment. There's a little bit up here, but that's where the executive system operates to shut it down uh, when you're in involved in goal-directed behavior. Lastly, let's look at treatment. Not an awful lot of treatment research here, but I'll summarize it very quickly. ADHD medications don't work very well for these children. We've known that for a number of years. If you have ADHD inattentive type, you're probably not going to do very well on stimulants. Uh, and now we have the first study of SCT directly at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital that shows that the level of SCT is a predictor of poor responding to methylphenidate. So the more SCT you are, the less likely you're going to do well on that medication. So that sort of backs up the earlier studies. There's a single study of atomoxetine with SCT showing that it has selective preferential benefits to treating SCT, even controlling for its positive benefits on ADHD. So there's something about a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor that might prove beneficial to the management of this disorder. But again, a couple of studies shouldn't be changing our practice to any great extent. Someone once said maybe we should try OCD-type medications like fluvoxamine or that we use for OCD and Tourette's. Uh, not sure about that because I don't think this is OCD or ruminative, but it could be. What about anti-narcoleptics, modafinil, so on? Maybe, but given that there's an adverse or negative response to methylphenidate, methylphenidate is an anti-narcoleptic. I'm not sure we're going to find anything there either. What about psychosocial treatments? We don't know. There are three studies, one of social skills training, showing SCT kids probably do a little better in social skills training, whereas ADHD children do not do well in social skills training, and 25% of them get worse. Social skills training harms ADHD children. 
which is why we don't recommend it, and that is because of what's called deviancy training. Aggressive children train up their peers. So you don't want to be mixing highly aggressive children in with each other. There are side effects to psychosocial treatments, and that is one of the adverse events linked to social skills training. However, social skills training might work well for SCT because it's an internalizing type disorder, and social skills training has always worked well for anxiety, particularly social anxiety, more than it ever has for externalizing disorders like ADHD. We don't know about cognitive therapy. It does not work for ADHD until adulthood. Even then, it must target executive deficits. It works very well for anxiety and depression. Maybe we should go back and revisit CBT for SCT. We don't know. There's a dissertation for you. If you're looking for one, I just gave you one. Linda Feifner is the only one who's done behavioral studies of SCT, and she found that they do as well or better than ADHD children in behavior modification programs that target their symptoms. This is just my slide to once again remind you I hate the name of this disorder. I wish they would change it. My staff and I have come up with this. I don't care if you use it or not. I would just like to see us move away from what is a demeaning, pejorative, and offensive label to patients who tell us that repeatedly whenever they, they hear that term. Can't you guys come up with something better? And I think we should. So to summarize, ADHD is an executive disorder by another name, highly impairing, highly associated with disruption, dysregulation, and so on. SCT is not. ADHD is an externalizing disorder. It looks like SCT is more like an internalizing disorder. So if we go down our checklist, what's the evidence? Do we have different symptoms? Yes. Do they cohere? Yes. Are they distinct dimensions from other forms of psychopathology? Undoubtedly. Are there differences in demographics? Yes. Is there differences in cognitive correlates? Probably, yes. Differences in impairments? Probably. The more we learn, the more yes. Differences in comorbidity? Without a doubt, that's one of the most reliable differences in the literature. What about biological correlates? We don't know. What about course? The first follow-up study was just published a month ago. It's a nine-year follow-up of children in Spain, and it shows that SCT is highly stable even more stable than ADHD from childhood to adolescence, and is a strong predictor of adolescent depression and anxiety, even controlling for baseline depression and anxiety in childhood. So it looks like it's possibly an internalizing, not an externalizing disorder. Distinct etiology, maybe, but we don't know. What about family history? No studies. What about treatment response? Don't have enough evidence to say, but at the moment, it's looking like treatments for ADHD don't work well for SCT, and we need to go back and explore a new package of treatments for SCT. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> 25 years of research in an hour. <laughs> Thank you, Russ, for You're this welcome. extremely thought-provoking yeah. presentation. And I think a lot of people, um, you know, actually felt, yes, 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 mm -hmm. on a number of things that you yeah. said. So, time will tell. Right? I, I also think that some people got a bit disappointed at the end because mm -hmm. there's so little to suggest, but what should we do? Yes, I know, what should um, we do? But we have to live with what we have. Absolutely. Right. One of the things I was wondering about is the relationship. Uh, you know, we have used much more than most people in the field the um, concept of developmental coordination disorder. Oh, yes. yes. And of course, as I was listening to you, I can't help but think about a number of cases sure. that we in the past usually have talked with the parents about as this is ADD mm -hmm. rather than, uh, you know, ADHD. Right. And usually that group has more motor control problems yeah. than the, the typical child with ADHD. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the past, we've always looked at how much does DCD contribute to the poor outcome? And they Certainly. have much more depression, yes. much more anxiety. Yeah. And so, again... And I even mean, social problems. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and even, um, I mean, we're definitely going to be hopefully using the CDD yes. term rather than <laughs> the Stuggers Cognitive I would like temp. that, but, you know, pick a different term. The, right? the problem with Damp. CDD is it used to mean childhood disintegrative disorder. I know. Uh, I and know. so yeah. that might be a problem. I know. You never Could know. Could be. The acronyms are always a problem. Yeah, they're right? always a problem, yeah. but they're always also, yeah. you know, stimulating people. Sure. Right. 
So we're definitely going to be looking more into your model of uh, sluggish so. cognitive tempo or yeah. CDD. But I think it would be good if other people were more into also looking at the DCD component. Yeah. Uh, and um, again, just as with the rating scales for um, uh, these things that they predict much more in terms of real executive function than yeah. tests do, so does some of the research that we've done on motor control problems in the mm -hmm. kids. You can have somebody do an extremely thorough uh, motor examination and come up with, oh yeah. yes, there's this and that, but yeah. not very much. Right. But when you actually use it in f the form of a questionnaire, right. you get much more to the root much of the problem. Separation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so even though I I'm one of the you know, strongest opponents of people saying, oh, we just use rating scales yes. uh, and we don't do anything else. We don't even clinically look at the patients. I think that's totally wrong. Yes. But I certainly agree with you when it comes to the um, risk of using tests yes. for anything other than really IQ or the yeah. skills <laughs> that are associated with the IQ test. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah. So... Uh, well, that's good to hear because I, the, the pushback I get from my neuropsychology colleagues who make a living yeah. giving test batteries is often rather strong, although they cannot provide evidence to support their... Criticism. And also very often the test batteries are so long yeah. uh, and take so much time. Mm -hmm. And if, as you say, and I think it's quite true, that they don't really help you other than the whisk or the vice or right. whatever, uh, predict anything. Right. Uh, why use them? And right. it, it just means a lot of services are being used up for the diagnosis of something. Four to it, six hours in some yeah. cases. Yeah. Or, or yeah. days yes. or weeks or months, yeah. Yeah. For, for testing. sometimes at least. In no, I, I agree, and it's nice to hear that uh, you're, you're seeing the same thing. But so. do you think, uh, on the basis of your own experience in the field, that you shouldn't even try a stimulant in, in a case with CDD or sluggish cognitive? No, not necessarily, because even the Cincinnati studies showed that they don't have an adverse reaction. It's not like you've made them worse or done harm. What you get is a poor response. It's mediocre. It's unimpressive. The first study that we did showed that 20% of kids with SCT responded to methylphenidate. They responded at the starting light beginning dose. Yeah. There was no further improvement. If you were going to get it, you were going to get it there yeah. and nowhere else. ADHD almost never responds at the starting dose, and you have to push your dose yeah. up to moderate or yeah. larger doses to begin to get the effect. So what happened at the end of our double-blind placebo-controlled trial in that study, 93% of ADHD children continued on a stimulant following the trial. 20% yeah. of SCT children were kept on that stimulant. So, but and that's a blinded study of, of the results. Do so you think it would be a good idea to always at least consider atomoxetine? I would use it as the first choice uh -huh. just because we have evidence of a unique yeah. effect uh, that's been uh, uh, replicated as well. Uh, whereas with methylphenidate, it's rolling the dice. You don't know whether it's going to work or not. Or would it be uh, and I think it's, I'd rather use a non-controlled than a controlled substance. Yeah. Yeah. Or would it be a good idea to start with a very small dose of, say, methylphenidate, yeah. just to see whether it has any effect at all? And if it doesn't, and you start pushing it up, and you see no further positive effect, you, the, you try atomoxetine? Or yeah, well, it's a good suggestion. I think, to me, though, uh, the answer to that probably has to do with efficiency, uh, and that is that stimulants can be tested immediately. They're rapidly acting. You're going to know within the first dose whether this is going to benefit this child. Yeah. And let's move on. Whereas atomoxetine, we're talking about one to two weeks yeah. of careful titration before we start to see good therapeutic benefits. Yeah. So uh, in, in that sense, you'll know right away whether methylphenidate is going to be helpful. It still doesn't rule out whether you should go back to atomoxetine or not. And I, I want to put in a plug again for the, the psychosocial treatments. Anxiety... Yeah is the best predictor of response to all psychosocial interventions. Yeah. The more anxious you are, the better you do, whether it's social skills, whether it's behavioral, uh, in school, at home, uh, whether it's family parent training. Anxiety is a, a very good predictor of which children seem to respond well. Mm -hmm. Given that these children look like internalizing type children, 
Um, I think that we shouldn't just be looking at medications. I like no, no. going back and let's study social skills, let's study CBT, let's study other interventions for no, these I, kids. I, I'm just bringing that up because currently, yes. of course, there is a, a worldwide the trend that you are more positive to using medications at all. Yes, that's in true. the past, in this country, it was like, no, no. Oh, I know. Uh, yeah. But now it's gone the other way. I'm uh, old enough and to therefore remember. I, yeah. I just want to hear your opinion about yes. which drug would be more useful to start with. And I think yeah. you've already responded yeah, to that. I think it has to do with efficiency. Yeah, but we okay. will hopefully see much more of all types of uh, intervention research for this group, yeah, which I is so. different from uh, what most people think about as ADHD. I hope so. Let, let me put in a plug to uh, students and my junior colleagues. If you're looking to make a name for yourself in an area of research <laughs> and publish, <laughs> You don't try ADHD. It's like going into physics. There's 50,000 studies you have to know. You're going to have to choose a very specific area. Here's just you could do anything on SCT, as I was telling your research team this morning. It would be instantly publishable. It would contribute to the literature. You could make a name for yourself. You could still study ADHD as a control group. Uh, and you would be doing us all a great service uh, by publishing in that area as well. Okay. So. I think we should end on that note. So do I. The, right. The future is SCT yeah. or CDD or, <laughs> or something. whatever. Yeah, something. Okay. So, all thanks right. so much. It's thank been you, Chris. absolutely What a pleasure. Great. Thank you. Eva, thank you. thank you as well. Thank you, thank you so much. My pleasure. You're welcome.